Chapter Fourteen of *The Hour of the Dragon* by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen: The Black Hand of Set. Conan woke from a sound sleep as quickly and instantly as a cat, and like a cat, he was on his feet with his sword out before the man who had touched him could so much as draw back. "'What word, Puglio?' demanded Conan, recognizing his host. The gold lamp burned low, casting a mellow glow over the thick tapestries and the rich coverings of the couch whereon he had been reposing. Puglio, recovering from the start given him by the sudden action of his awakening guest, replied, "'The Zingaran has been located. He arrived yesterday at dawn. Only a few hours ago he sought to sell a huge, strange jewel to a Shemitish merchant, but the Shemite would have naught to do with it. Men say he turned pale beneath his black beard at the sight of it, and, closing his stall, fled as from a thing accursed. "'It must be Belloso,' muttered Conan, feeling the pulse in his temples, pounding with impatient eagerness. "'Where is he now?' "'He sleeps in the house of Servio.' i know that dive of old grunted conan i'd better hasten before some of these waterfront thieves cut his throat for the jewel he took up his cloak and flung it over his shoulders then donned a helmet publio had procured for him have my steeds saddled and ready in the court said he i may return in haste i shall not forget this night's work publio a few moments later publio standing at a small outer door watched the king's tall figure receding down the shadowy street farewell to you corsair muttered the merchant this must be a notable jewel to be sought by a man who has just lost a kingdom i wish i had told my knaves to let him secure it before they did their work but then something might have gone awry let argos forget amra and let my dealings with him be lost in the dust of the past in the alley behind the house of servio that is where conan will cease to be a peril to me servio's house a dingy ill-famed den was located close to the wharves facing the waterfront it was a shambling building of stone and heavy ship beams and a long narrow alley wandered up alongside it Conan made his way along the alley, and as he approached the house he had an uneasy feeling that he was being spied upon. He stared hard into the shadows of the squalid buildings, but saw nothing, though once he caught the faint rasp of cloth or leather against flesh. But that was nothing unusual. Thieves and beggars prowled these alleys all night, and they were not likely to attack him after one look at his size and harness. But suddenly a door opened in the wall ahead of him, and he slipped into the shadow of an arch. A figure emerged from the open door and moved along the alley, not furtively, but with a natural noiselessness like that of a jungle beast. Although starlight filtered into the alley to silhouette the man's profile, dimly, as he passed the doorway where Conan lurked. The stranger was a Stygian. There was no mistaking that hawk-faced shaven head even in the starlight, nor the mantle over the broad shoulders. He passed on down the alley in the direction of the beach, and once Conan thought he must be carrying a lantern among his garments, for he caught a flash of lambent light just as the man vanished. But the Cimmerian forgot the stranger, as he noticed that the door through which he had emerged still stood open. Conan had intended entering by the main entrance and forcing Servio to show him the room where the Zingaran slept. But if he could get into the house without attracting anyone's attention, so much the better. A few long strides brought him to the door, and as his hand fell on the lock, he stifled an involuntary grunt. His practiced fingers, skilled among the thieves of Zamora long ago, told him that the lock had been forced, apparently by some terrific pressure from the outside, that had twisted and bent the heavy iron bolts, tearing the very sockets loose from the jams. 
how such damage could have been wrought so violently without awakening everyone in the neighborhood conan could not imagine but he felt sure that it had been done that night a broken lock if discovered would not go unmended in the house of servio in the neighborhood of thieves and cutthroats conan entered stealthily poignard at hand wondering how he was to find the chamber of the zingaran groping in total darkness he halted suddenly he sensed death in that room as a wild beast senses it not as peril threatening him but a dead thing something freshly slain in the darkness his foot hit and recoiled from something heavy and yielding with a sudden premonition he groped along the wall until he found the shelf that supported the brass lamp, with its flint, steel, and tinder beside it. A few seconds later, a flickering, uncertain light sprang up, and he stared narrowly about him. A bunk built against the rough stone wall, a bare table, and a bench completed the furnishings of the squalid chamber. An inner door stood closed and bolted and on the hard beaten dirt floor lay beloso on his back he lay with his head drawn back between his shoulders so that he seemed to stare with his wide glassy eyes at the sooty beams of the cobwebbed ceiling his lips were drawn back from his teeth in a frozen grin of agony his sword lay near him still in its scabbard his shirt was torn open and on his brown muscular breast was the print of a black hand thumb and forefingers plainly distinct conan glared in silence feeling the short hairs bristle at the back of his neck crom he muttered the black hand of set he had seen that mark of old the death mark of the black priests of set the grim cult that ruled in dark Stygia. And suddenly he remembered that curious flash he had seen emanating from the mysterious Stygian who had emerged from this chamber. The heart, by Krom, he muttered. He was carrying it under his mantle. He stole it. He burst that door by his magic and slew Beloso. He was a priest of Set. A quick investigation confirmed at least part of his suspicions. The jewel was not on the Zingaran's body. An uneasy feeling rose in Conan that this had not happened by chance or without design. A conviction that the mysterious Stygian galley had come into the harbor of Mesantia on a definite mission. How could the priests of Set know that the heart had come southward? Yet the thought was no more fantastic than the necromancy that could slay an armed man by the touch of an open, empty hand. A stealthy footfall outside the door brought him round like a great cat. With one motion he extinguished the lamp and drew his sword. His ears told him that men were out there in the darkness, were closing in on the doorway. As his eyes became accustomed to the sudden darkness, he could make out dim figures ranging the entrance. He could not guess their identity, but as always he took the initiative, leaping suddenly forth from the doorway without awaiting the attack. His unexpected movement took the skulkers by surprise. He sensed and heard men close about him, saw a dim masked figure in the starlight before him, then his sword crunched home, and he was fleeing away down the alley, before the slower-thinking and slower-acting attackers could intercept him. As he ran, he heard, somewhere ahead of him, a faint creak of oarlocks, and he forgot the men behind him. A boat was moving out into the bay. Gritting his teeth, he increased his speed, but before he reached the beach, he heard the rasp and creak of ropes and the grind of the great sweep in its socket. Thick clouds rolling up from the sea obscured the stars. In thick darkness Conan came upon the strand, straining his eyes out across the black restless water. Something was moving out there, a long, low black shape that receded in the darkness, gathering momentum as it went. 
to his ears came the rhythmic clack of long oars he ground his teeth in helpless fury it was the stygian galley and she was racing out to sea bearing with her the jewel that meant to him the throne of aquilonia with a savage curse he took a step toward the waves that lapped against the sands catching at his halbert and intending to rip it off and swim after the vanishing ship then the crunch of a heel in the sand brought him about he had forgotten his pursuers dark figures closed in on him with a rush of feet through the sands the first went down beneath the cimmerian's flailing sword but the others did not falter blades wickered dimly about him in the darkness or rasped on his mail blood and entrails spilled over his hand and someone screamed as he ripped murderously upward a muttered voice spurred on the attack and that voice sounded vaguely familiar conan plowed through the clinging hacking shapes toward the voice a faint light gleaming momentarily through the drifting clouds showed him a tall gaunt man with a great livid scar on his temple conan's sword sheared through his skull as through a ripe melon then an axe swung blindly in the dark crashed on the king's bassinet filling his eyes with sparks of fire he lurched and lunged felt his sword sink deep and heard a shriek of agony then he stumbled over a corpse and a bludgeon knocked the dented helmet from his head the next instant the club fell full on his unprotected skull the king of aquilonia crumpled into the wet sands over him wolfish figures panted in the gloom <sighs> strike off his head muttered one let him lie grunted another help me tie up my wounds before i bleed to death the tide will wash him into the bay see <sighs> he fell at the water's edge his skull split no man could live after such blows help me strip him urged another his harness will fetch a few pieces of silver and haste tiberio is dead and i hear seamen singing as they reel along the strand let us be gone there followed hurried activity in the darkness and then the sound of quickly receding footsteps the tipsy singing of the seamen grew louder in his chamber Publio, nervously pacing back and forth before a window that overlooked the shadowed bay, whirled suddenly, his nerves tingling. To the best of his knowledge the door had been bolted from within. But now it stood open, and four men filed into the chamber. At the sight of them his flesh crawled. Many strange beings Publio had seen in his lifetime but none before like these they were tall and gaunt black robed and their faces were dim yellow ovals in the shadows of their coifs he could not tell much about their features and was unreasoningly glad that he could not each bore a long curiously mottled staff who are you he demanded and his voice sounded brittle and hollow what do you wish here where is conan he who was king of aquilonia demanded the tallest of the four in a passionless monotone that made publio shudder it was like the hollow tone of a keithan temple bell i I do, I do not know what you mean stammered the merchant his customary poise shaken by the uncanny aspect of his visitors i know no such man he has been here returned the other with no change of inflection his horse is in the courtyard tell us where he is before we do you an injury jebal shouted publio frantically recoiling until he crouched against the wall jebal the four kithans watched him without emotion or change of expression if you summon your slave he will die warned one of them which only served to terrify publio more than ever jebel he screamed where are you curse you thieves are murdering your master swift footsteps padded in the corridor outside and jebel burst into the chamber 
a shemite of medium height and mightily muscled build his curled blue-black beard bristling and a short leaf-shaped sword in his hand he stared in stupid amazement at the four invaders unable to understand their presence dimly remembering that he had drowsed unexplainably on the stair he was guarding and up which they must have come he had never slept on duty before but his master was shrieking with a note of hysteria in his voice and the shemite drove like a bull at the strangers his thickly muscled arm drawing back for the disemboweling thrust but the stroke was never dealt a black sleeved arm shot out extending the long staff its end but touched the shemite's brawny breast and was instantly withdrawn the stroke was horribly like the dart and recovery of a serpent's head jebel halted shortly in his headlong plunge as if he had encountered a solid barrier his bull head toppled forward on his breast the sword slipped from his fingers and then he melted slowly to the floor it was as if all the bones of his frame had suddenly become flabby Publio turned sick do not shout again advised the tallest Keithan. your servants sleep soundly but if you awaken them they will die and you with them where is conan he has gone to the house of servio near the waterfront to search for the zingaran beloso gasped publio all his power of resistance gone out of him the merchant did not lack courage but these uncanny visitants turned his marrow to water he started convulsively at a sudden noise of footsteps hurrying up the stair outside loud in the ominous stillness your servant asked the kitten publio shook his head mutely his tongue frozen to his palate he could not speak one of the kittens brought up a silken cover from a couch and threw it over the corpse then they melted into the tapestry but before the tallest man disappeared he murmured talk to this man who comes and send him away quickly if you betray us neither he nor you will live to reach that door make no sign to show him you are not alone and lifting his staff suggestively the yellow man faded behind the hangings Publio shuddered and choked down a desire to retch. It might have been a trick of the light, but it seemed to him that occasionally those staffs moved slightly of their own accord, as if possessed of an unspeakable life of their own. He pulled himself together with a mighty effort and presented a composed aspect to the ragged ruffian who burst into the chamber. "'We have done what you wished, my lord,' this man exclaimed the barbarian lies dead on the sands at the water's edge publio felt a movement in the auras behind him and almost burst from fright the man swept heedlessly on your secretary tiberio is is dead the barbarians slew him and four of my companions we bore their bodies to the rendezvous there was nothing of value on the barbarian except a few silver coins are there any further orders none gasped publio white about the lips go the desperado bowed and hurried out with a vague feeling that publio was both a man of weak stomach and few words the four kittens came from behind the arras of whom did this man speak the taller demanded of a wandering stranger who did me an injury panted publio you lie said the kitten calmly he spoke of the king of aquilonia i read it in your expression sit upon that divan and do not move or speak i will remain with you while my three companions go search for the body so publio sat and shook with terror of the silent inscrutable figure which watched him until the three kittens filed back into the room with the news that conan's body did not lie upon the sands publio did not know whether to be glad or sorry we found the spot where the fight was fought 
they said. Blood was on the sand, but the king was gone. The fourth kithen drew imaginary symbols upon the carpet with his staff, which glistened scalily in the lamplight. Did you read naught from the sands? he asked. Aye, they answered. The king lives, and he has gone southward in a ship. The tall kithen lifted his head and gazed at Publio, so that the merchant broke into a profuse sweat. What do you wish of me? he stuttered. A ship, answered the kithen, a ship well manned for a very long voyage. For, for how long a voyage? stammered Publio, never thinking of refusing. To the ends of the world, perhaps, answered the kithen, or to the molten seas of hell that lie beyond the sunrise. End of chapter 14、Chapter、fifteen of the hour of the dragon by robert e howard this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen the return of the corsair conan's first sensation of returning consciousness was that of motion under him was no solidity but a ceaseless heaving and plunging then he heard wind humming through the cords and spars and knew he was aboard a ship even before his blurred sight cleared he heard a mutter of voices and then a dash of water deluged him jerking him sharply into full animation he heaved up with a sulphurous curse braced his legs and glared about him with a burst of coarse guffaws in his ears and the reek of unwashed bodies in his nostrils he was standing on the poop deck of a long galley which was running before the wind that whipped down from the north her striped sail bellying against the taut sheets the sun was just rising in a dazzling blaze of gold and blue and green to the left of the shoreline was a dim purple shadow to the right stretched the open ocean this much conan saw at a glance that likewise included the ship itself it was long and narrow a typical trading ship of the southern coasts high of poop and stern with cabins at either extremity conan looked down into the open waste whence wafted that sickening abominable odor he knew it of old it was the body scent of the oarmen chained to their benches they were all negroes forty men to each side each confined by a chain locked about his waist with the other end welded to a heavy ring set deep in the solid runaway beam that ran between the benches from stem to stern the life of a slave aboard an argosian galley was a hell unfathomable most of these were cushites but some thirty of the blacks who now rested on their idle oars and stared up at the stranger with dull curiosity were from the far southern isles the homelands of the corsairs conan recognized them by their straighter features and hair their rangier cleaner limbed build and he saw among them men who had followed him of old but all this he saw and recognized in one swift all-embracing glance as he rose before he turned his attention to the figures about him reeling momentarily on braced legs his fists clenched wrathfully he glared at the figures clustered about him the sailor who had drenched him stood grinning the empty bucket still poised in his hand and conan cursed him with venom instinctively reaching for his hilt then he discovered that he was weaponless and naked except for his short leather breeks what lousy tub is this he roared how did i come aboard here the sailors laughed jeeringly stocky bearded argosians to a man and one whose richer dress and air of command proclaimed him captain folded his arms and said domineeringly we found you lying on the sands somebody had wrapped you on the pate and taken your clothes needing an extra man we brought you aboard what ship is this conan demanded the venturer 
out of Missantia with a cargo of mirrors, scarlet silk cloaks, shields, gilded helmets, and swords to trade to the Shemites for copper and gold ore. I am Demetrio, captain of this vessel, and your master henceforward. Then I'm headed in the direction I wanted to go, after all, muttered Conan, heedless of that last remark. They were racing southeastward, following the long curve of the Argosian coast. These trading ships never ventured far from the shoreline. Somewhere ahead of him he knew that low, dark Stygian galley was speeding southward. "'Have you sighted a Stygian galley?' began Conan, but the beard of the burly, brutal-faced captain bristled. He was not in the least interested in any question his prisoner might wish to ask, and felt at high time he reduced this independent wastrel to his proper place. "'Get forward!' he roared. "'I've wasted enough time with you. I've done you the honor of having you brought to the poop to be revived, and answered enough of your infernal questions. Get off this poop. You'll work your way aboard this gallery.' "'I'll buy your ship,' began Conan, before he remembered that he was a penniless wanderer. A roar of rough mirth greeted these words, and the captain turned purple thinking he sensed ridicule you mutinous swine he bellowed taking a threatening step forward while his hand closed on the knife at his belt get forward before i have you flogged you'll keep a civil tongue in your jaws or by mithra i'll have you chained among the blacks to tug an oar conan's volcanic temper never long at best burst into explosion not in years even before he was king had a man spoken to him thus and lived don't lift your voice to me you tar-breeched dog he roared in a voice as gusty as the sea wind while the sailors gaped dumbfounded draw that toy and i'll feed you to the fishes who do you think you are gasped the captain i'll show you roared the maddened cimmerian and he wheeled and bounded toward the rail where weapons hung in their brackets the captain drew his knife and ran at him bellowing but before he could strike conan gripped his wrist with a wrench that tore the arm clean out of the socket the captain bellowed like an ox in agony and then rolled clear across the deck as he was hurled contemptuously from his attacker Conan ripped a heavy axe from the rail and wheeled cat-like to meet the rush of the sailors. They ran in, giving tongue like hounds, clumsy-footed and awkward in comparison to the pantherish Cimmerian. Before they could reach him with their knives, he sprang among them, striking right and left too quickly for the eye to follow, and blood and brains spattered as two corpses struck the deck knives flailed the air wildly as conan broke through the stumbling gasping mob and bounded to the narrow bridge that spanned the waist from poop to forecastle just out of reach of the slaves below behind him the handful of sailors on the poop were floundering after him daunted by the destruction of their fellows and the rest of the crew some thirty in all came running across the bridge toward him with weapons in their hands conan bounded out on the bridge and stood poised above the upturned black faces axe lifted black mane blown in the wind who am i he yelled look you dogs look ajanga yasunga laranga who am i and from the waste rose a shout that swelled to a mighty roar amra it is amra the lion has returned the sailors who caught and understood the burden of that awesome shout paled and shrank back staring in sudden fear at the wild figure on the bridge was this in truth that bloodthirsty ogre of the southern seas who had so mysteriously vanished years ago but who still lived in gory legends the blacks were frothing crazy now shaking and tearing at their chains and shrieking the name of amra like an invocation 
Cushites, who had never seen Conan before, took up the yell. The slaves in the pen under the after-cabin began to batter at the walls, shrieking like the damned. Demetrio, hitching himself along the deck on one hand and his knees, livid with the agony of his dislocated arm, screamed, "'In and kill him, dogs, before the slaves break loose!' Fired to desperation by that word, the most dread to all galleymen, the sailors charged onto the bridge from both ends. But with a lion-like bound, Conan left the bridge and hit like a cat on his feet on the runway between the benches. "'Death to the masters!' he thundered, and his axe rose and fell crashingly full on a shackle-chain, severing it like matchwood. In an instant a shrieking slave was free, splintering his oar for a bludgeon. Men were racing frantically along the bridge above, and all hell and bedlam broke loose on the venturer. Conan's axe rose and fell without pause, and with every stroke a frothing, screaming black giant broke free, mad with hate and the fury of freedom and vengeance. Sailors, leaping down into the waist to grapple or smite at the naked white giant, hewing like one possessed at the shackles, found themselves dragged down by the hands of slaves yet unfreed, while others, their broken chains whipping and snapping about their limbs, came up out of the waist like a blind black torrent, screaming like fiends, smiting with broken oars and pieces of iron, tearing and rending with talons and teeth. In the midst of the melee, the slaves in the pen broke down the walls and came surging up on the decks, and with fifty blacks freed of their benches, Conan abandoned his iron hewing and bounded up on the bridge to add his notched axe to the bludgeons of his partisans. Then it was massacre. The Argosians were strong, sturdy, fearless like all their race, trained in the brutal school of the sea. But they could not stand against these maddened giants, led by the tigerish barbarian. Blows and abuse and hellish suffering were avenged in one red gust of fury that raged like a typhoon from one end of the ship to the other. And when it had blown itself out, but one white man lived aboard the venturer, and that was the blood-stained giant about whom the chanting blacks thronged to cast themselves prostrate on the bloody deck and beat their heads against the boards in an ecstasy of hero worship conan his mighty chest heaving and glistening with sweat the red axe gripped in his blood-smeared hand glared about him as the first chief of men might have glared in some primordial dawn and shook his black mane in that moment he was not king of aquilonia he was again lord of the black corsairs who had hacked his way to lordship through flame and blood amra amra chanted the delirious blacks those who were left to chant the lion has returned now will the stygians howl like dogs in the night and the black dogs of kush will howl now will villages burst in flames and ships founder ay there will be wailing of women and the thunder of the spears cease this yammering dogs conan roared in a voice that drowned the clap of the sail in the wind ten of you go below and free the oarsmen who are yet chained the rest of you man the sweeps and bend to oars and halyards crom's devils don't you see we've drifted inshore during the fight do you want to run aground and be retaken by the Argosians? Throw these carcasses overboard. Jump to it, you rogues, or I'll notch your hides for you. With shouts and laughter and wild singing, they leaped to do his commands. The corpses, white and black, were hurled overboard, where triangular fins were already cutting the water. Conan stood on the poop, frowning down at the black men who watched him expectantly. His heavy brown arms were folded, his black hair grown long in his wanderings blew in the wind. A wilder and more barbaric figure never trod the bridge of a ship, and in this ferocious corsair few of the courtiers of Aquilonia would have recognized their king. "'There's food in the hold!' 
he roared weapons in plenty for you for this ship carried blades and harness to the shemites who dwelt along the coast there are enough of us to work ship ay and to fight you rode in chains for the argosian dogs will you row as free men for amra ay they roared we are thy children lead us where you will then fall to and clean out that waste he commanded free men don't labor in such filth three of you come with me and break out food from the after cabin by crom i'll pat out your ribs before this cruise is done another yell of approbation answered him as the half-starved blacks scurried to do his bidding the sail bellied as the wind swept over the waves with renewed force and the white crests danced along the sweep of the wind conan planted his feet to the heave of the deck breathed deep and spread his mighty arms king of aquilonia he might no longer be king of the blue ocean he was still end of chapter 15Chapter Sixteen of the Hour of the Dragon by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Sixteen, Black Walled Kahemi. The venturer swept southward like a living thing, her oars pulled now by free and willing hands. She had been transformed from a peaceful trader into a war galley in so far as the transformation was possible men sat at the benches now with swords at their sides and gilded helmets on their kinky heads shields were hung along the rails and sheaths of spears bows and arrows adorned the mast even the elements seemed to work for conan now the broad purple sail bellied to a stiff breeze that held day by day needing little aid from the oars but though conan kept a man on the masthead day and night they did not sight a long low black galley fleeing southward ahead of them day by day the blue waters rolled empty to their view broken only by fishing craft which fled like frightened birds before them at sight of the shields hung along the rail the season for trading was practically over for the year and they sighted no other ships when the lookout did sight a sail it was to the north not the south far on the skyline behind them appeared a racing galley with full spread of purple sail the blacks urged conan to turn and plunder it but he shook his head somewhere south of him a slim black galley was racing toward the ports of stygia that night before darkness shut down the lookout's last glimpse showed him the racing galley on the horizon and at dawn it was still hanging on their tail afar off tiny in the distance conan wondered if it was following him though he could think of no logical reason for such a supposition but he paid little heed each day that carried him farther southward filled him with fiercer impatience doubts never assailed him as he believed in the rise and set of the sun he believed the priest of set had stolen the heart of Ataman and where would a priest of set carry it but to stygia the blacks sensed his eagerness and toiled as they had never toiled under the lash though ignorant of his goal they anticipated a red career of pillage and plunder and were content the men of the southern isles knew no other trade and the cushites of the crew joined wholeheartedly in the prospect of looting their own people with the callousness of their race blood ties meant little a victorious chieftain and personal gain everything soon the character of the coastline changed no longer they sailed past steep cliffs with blue hills marching behind him now the shore was the edge of broad meadowlands which barely rose above the water's edge and swept away and away into the hazy distance here were few harbors and fewer ports but the green plain was dotted with the cities of the Shemites, green sea lapping the rim of the green plains, and the ziggurats of the cities gleaming whitely in the sun, some small in the distance. 
Through the grazing lands moved the herds of cattle, and squat broad riders with cylindrical helmets and curled blue-black beards with bows in their hands. This was the shore of the lands of Shem, where there was no law save as each city-state could enforce its own. Far to the eastward, Conan knew, the meadowlands gave way to desert, where there were no cities, and the nomadic tribes roamed unhindered. Still, as they plied southward, past the changeless panorama of city-dotted meadowland, at last the scenery again began to alter. Clumps of tamarind appeared. The palm groves grew denser. The shoreline became more broken, a marching rampart of green fronds and trees, and behind them rose bare sandy hills. Streams poured into the sea, and along their moist banks vegetation grew thick and of vast variety. Though at last they passed the mouth of a broad river that mingled its flow with the ocean, and saw the great black walls and towers of Kahemi rise against the southern horizon. The river was the Styx, the real border of Stygia. Kahemi was Stygia's greatest port, and at that time her most important city. The king dwelt at more ancient Luxor, but in Kahemi reigned the priestcraft. Though men said the center of their dark religion lay far inland, in a mysterious deserted city near the bank of the Styx. This river, springing from some nameless source far in the unknown land south of Stygia, ran northward for a thousand miles before it turned and flowed westward for some hundreds of miles to empty at last into the ocean. The venturer showed no lights, stole past the port in the night, and before dawn discovered her, anchored in a small bay a few miles south of the city. It was surrounded by marsh, a green tangle of mangroves, palms, and lianas, swarming with crocodiles and serpents. Discovery was extremely unlikely. Conan knew the place of old. He had hidden there before in his corsair days. As they slid silently past the city, whose great black bastions rose on the jutting prongs of land which locked the harbor, Torches gleamed and smoldered luridly, and to their ears came the low thunder of drums. The port was not crowded with ships, as were the harbors of Argos. The Stygians did not base their glory and power upon ships and fleets. Trading vessels and war galleys indeed they had, but not in proportion to their inland strength. Many of their craft plied up and down the great river rather than along the sea coasts. The Stygians were an ancient race, a dark, inscrutable people, powerful and merciless. Long ago their rule had stretched far north of the Styx, beyond the meadowlands of Shem, and into the fertile uplands now inhabited by the peoples of Koth and Ophir and Argos. Their borders had marched with those of ancient Acheron, but Acheron had fallen and the barbaric ancestors of the Hyborians had swept southward in wolfskins and horn helmets, driving the ancient rulers of the land before them. The Stygians had not forgotten. All day the venturer lay at anchor in the tiny bay, walled in with green branches and tangled vines, through which flitted grey-plumed harsh-voiced birds, and among which glided bright scaled silent reptiles. Toward sundown a small boat crept out and down along the river, seeking and finding that which Conan desired, a Stygian fisherman in his shallow, flat-prowed boat. They brought him to the deck of the venturer, a tall, dark, rangely-built man, ashen with fear of his captors, who were ogres of that coast. He was naked except for his silken breeks, for, like the Hyrcanians, even the commoners and slaves of Stygia wore silk, and in his boat was a wide mantle, such as these fishermen flung about their shoulders against the chill of the night. He fell to his knees before Conan, expecting torture and death. "'Stand on your legs, man, and quit trembling,' said the Cimmerian impatiently, who found it difficult to understand abject terror. "'You won't be harmed. Tell me but this.' 
as a galley a black racing galley returned from argos put into kahemi within the last few days ay my lord answered the fisherman only yesterday at dawn the priest to Otothemes returned from a voyage far to the north men say he has been to mesantia what did he bring from mesantia alas my lord i know not why did he go to mesantia demanded conan nay my lord i am but a common man uh, who am i to know the minds of the priests of set i can only speak what i have seen and what i have heard men whisper along the wharves men say that news of great import came southward though of what none knows and it is well known that the lord to utter themes put off in his black galley in great haste now he is returned but what he did in argos or what cargo he brought back none knows not even the seamen who manned his galley men say that he has opposed thoth ammon who is the master of all priests of set and dwells in luxor and that to utter themes seeks hidden power to overthrow the great one but who am i to say when priests war with one another a common man can but lie on his belly and hope neither treads upon him conan snarled in nervous exasperation at this servile philosophy and turned to his men i am going alone into kahemi to find this thief to utter themes keep this man prisoner but see that you do him no harm crom's devil stop your yowling do you think we can sail into the harbor and take the city by storm i must go alone silencing the clamor of protests he doffed his own garments and donned the prisoner's silk breeches and sandals and the band from the man's hair but scorned the short fisherman's knife the common men of stygia were not allowed to wear swords and the mantle was not voluminous enough to hide the cimmerian's long blade but conan buckled to his hip a ganata knife a weapon borne by the fierce desert men who dwelt to the south of the stygians a broad heavy slightly curved blade of fine steel edged like a razor and long enough to dismember a man then leaving the stygian guarded by the corsairs conan climbed into the fisher's boat wait for me until dawn he said if i haven't come then i'll never come so hasten southward to your own homes as he clambered over the rail they set up a doleful wail at his going until he thrust his head back into sight to curse them into silence then dropping into the boat he grasped the oars and sent the tiny craft shooting over the waves more swiftly than its owner had ever propelled it end of chapter sixteen Chapter Seventeen of the Hour of the Dragon by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Seventeen. He has slain the sacred son of Set. The harbor of Kahemi lay between two great jutting points of land that ran into the ocean. He rounded the southern point, where the great black castles rose like a man-made hill and entered the harbor just at dusk when there was still enough light for the watchers to recognize the fisherman's boat and mantle but not enough to permit recognition of betraying details unchallenged he threaded his way among the great black war galleys lying silent and unlighted at anchor and drew up to a flight of wide stone steps which mounted up from the water's edge there he made his boat fast to an iron ring set in the stone as numerous similar craft were tied there was nothing strange in a fisherman leaving his boat there none but a fisherman could find a use for such a craft and they did not steal from one another no one cast him more than a casual glance as he mounted the long steps unobtrusively avoiding the torches that flared at intervals above the lapping black water he seemed but an ordinary empty-handed fisherman returning after a fruitless day along the coast if one had observed him closely it might have seemed that his step was somewhat too springy and sure his carriage somewhat too erect and confident for a lowly fisherman but he passed quickly keeping in the shadows and the commoners of stygia were no more given to analysis than were the commoners of the less exotic races in build 
he was not unlike the warrior castes of the stygians who were a tall muscular race bronzed by the sun he was nearly as dark as many of them his black hair square cut and confined by a copper band increased the resemblance the characteristics which set him apart from them were the subtle difference in his walk and his alien features and blue eyes but the mantle was a good disguise and he kept as much in the shadows as possible turning away his head when a native passed him too closely but it was a desperate game and he knew he could not long keep up the deception kahemi was not like the seaports of the hyborians where types of every race swarmed the only aliens here were negro and shemite slaves and he resembled neither even as much as he resembled the stygians themselves strangers were not welcome in the cities of stygia tolerated only when they came as ambassadors or licensed traders but even then the latter were not allowed ashore after dark and now there were no hyborian ships in the harbor at all a strange restlessness ran through the city a stirring of ancient ambitions a whispering none could define except those who whispered this conan felt rather than knew his wetted primitive instincts sensing unrest about him if he were discovered his fate would be ghastly they would slay him merely for being a stranger if he were recognized as amra the corsair chief who had swept their coasts with steel and flame an involuntary shudder twitched conan's broad shoulders human foes he did not fear nor any death by steel or fire but this was a black land of sorcery and nameless horror set the old serpent men said banished long ago from the hyborian races yet lurked in the shadows of the cryptic temples and awful and mysterious were the deeds done in the nighted shrines he had drawn away from the waterfront streets with their broad steps leading down to the water and was entering the long shadowy streets of the main part of the city there was no such scene as was offered by any hyborian city no blaze of lamps and cressets with gay clad people laughing and strolling along the pavements and shops and stalls wide open and displaying their wares here the stalls were closed at dusk the only lights along the streets were torches flaring smokily at wide intervals people walking the streets were comparatively few they went hurriedly and unspeaking and their numbers decreased with the lateness of the hour conan found the scene gloomy and unreal the silence of the people their furtive haste the great black stone walls that rose on each side of the streets there was a grim massiveness about stygian architecture that was overpowering and oppressive few lights showed anywhere except in the upper parts of the buildings conan knew that most of the people lay on the flat roofs among the palms of artificial gardens under the stars there was a murmur of weird music from somewhere occasionally a bronze chariot rumbled along the flags and there was a brief glimpse of a tall hawk-faced noble with a silk cloak wrapped about him and a gold band with a rearing serpent head emblem confining his black mane of the ebon naked charioteer bracing his knotty legs against the straining of the fierce stygian horses but the people who yet traversed the streets on foot were commoners slaves tradesmen harlots toilers and they became fewer as he progressed he was making toward the temple of set where he knew he would be likely to find the priest he sought he believed he would know through what the themes if he saw him though his one glance had been in the semi-darkness of the mesantian alley that the man he had seen there had been the priest he was certain only occultists high in the mazes of the hideous black ring possessed the power of the black hand that dealt death by its touch and only such a man would dare defy thoth amon whom the western world knew only as a figure of terror and myth the street broadened and conan was aware that he was getting into the part of the city dedicated to the temples 
the great structures reared their black bulks against the dim stars grim indescribably menacing in the flare of the few torches and suddenly he heard a low scream from a woman on the other side of the street and somewhat ahead of him a naked courtesan wearing the tall plumed headdress of her class she was shrinking back against the wall staring across at something he could not yet see at her cry the few people on the street halted suddenly as if frozen at the same instant conan was aware of a sinister slithering ahead of him then about the dark corner of the building he was approaching hoped a hideous wedge-shaped head and after it flowed coil after coil of rippling darkly glistening trunk the cimmerian recoiled remembering tales he had heard serpents were sacred to set god of stygia who men said was himself a serpent monsters such as this were kept in the temples of set and when they hungered were allowed to crawl forth into the streets to take what prey they wished their ghastly feasts were considered a sacrifice to the scaly god the stygians within conan's sight fell to their knees men and women and passively awaited their fate one the great serpent would select would lap in scaly coils crush to a red pulp and swallow as a rat snake swallows a mouse the others would live that was the will of the gods but it was not conan's will the python glided toward him its attention probably attracted by the fact that he was the only human in sight still standing erect gripping his great knife under his mantle conan hoped the slimy brute would pass him by but it halted before him and reared up horrifically in the flickering torchlight its forked tongue flickering in and out its cold eyes glittering with the ancient cruelty of the serpent folk its neck arched but before it could dart conan whipped his knife from under his mantle and struck like a flicker of lightning the broad blade split that wedge-shaped head and sheared deep into the thick neck conan wrenched his knife free and sprang clear as the great body knotted and looped and whipped terrifically in its death throes in the moment that he stood staring in morbid fascination the only sound was the thud and swish of the snake's tail against the stones then from the shocked votaries burst a terrible cry blasphemer he has slain the sacred son of set slay him slay slay stones whizzed about him and the crazed stygians rushed at him shrieking hysterically while from all sides others emerged from their houses and took up the cry with a curse conan wheeled and darted into the black mouth of an alley he heard the patter of the bare feet on the flags behind him as he ran more by feel than by sight and the walls resounded to the vengeful yells of the pursuers then his left hand found a break in the wall and he turned sharply into another narrower alley on both sides rose sheer black stone walls high above him he could see a thin line of stars these giant walls he knew were the walls of temples he heard behind him the pack sweep past the dark mouth in full cry their shouts grew distant faded away they had missed the smaller alley and run straight on in the blackness he too kept straight ahead though the thought of encountering another of set's sons in the darkness brought a shudder from him then somewhere ahead of him he caught a moving glow like that of a crawling glowworm he halted flattened himself against the wall and gripped his knife he knew what it was a man approaching with a torch now it was so close he could make out the dark hand that gripped it and the dim oval of a dark face a few more steps and the man would certainly see him he sank into a tigerish crouch the torch halted a door was briefly etched in the glow while the torch-bearer fumbled with it then it opened 
the tall figure vanished through it and darkness closed again on the alley there was a sinister suggestion of furtiveness about that slinking figure entering the alley door in darkness a priest perhaps returning from some dark errand but conan groped toward the door if one man came up that alley with a torch others might come at any time to retreat the way he had come might mean to run full into the mob from which he was fleeing at any moment they might return find the narrower alley and come howling down it he felt hemmed in by those sheer unscalable walls desirous of escape even if escape meant invading some unknown building the heavy bronze door was not locked it opened under his fingers and he peered through the crack he was looking into a great square chamber of massive black stone a torch smoldered in a niche in the wall the chamber was empty he glided through the lacquered door and closed it behind him his sandaled feet made no sound as he crossed the black marble floor a teak door stood partly open and gliding through this knife in hand he came out into a great dim shadowy place whose lofty ceiling was only a hint of darkness high above him toward which the black walls swept upward on all sides black arched doorways opened into the great still hall it was lit by curious bronze lamps that gave a dim weird light on the other side of the great hall a broad black marble stairway without a railing marched upward to lose itself in gloom and above him on all sides dim galleries hung like black stone ledges conan shivered he was in a temple of some stygian god if not set himself then someone barely less grim and the shrine did not lack an occupant in the midst of the great hall stood a black stone altar massive somber without carvings or ornament and upon it coiled one of the great sacred serpents its iridescent scales shimmering in the lamplight it did not move and conan remembered stories that the priests kept these creatures drugged part of the time the cimmerian took an uncertain step out from the door then shrank back suddenly not into the room he had just quitted but into a velvet curtained recess he had heard a soft step somewhere nearby from one of the black arches emerged a tall powerful figure in sandals and silken loincloth with a wide mantle trailing from his shoulders but face and head were hidden by a monstrous mask a half bestial half human countenance from the crest of which floated a mass of ostrich plumes in certain ceremonies the stygian priests went masked conan hoped the man would not discover him but some instinct warned the stygian he turned abruptly from his destination which apparently was the altar and stepped straight to the recess as he jerked aside the velvet hanging a hand darted from the shadows crushed the cry in his throat and jerked him headlong into the alcove and the knife impaled him conan's next move was the obvious one suggested by logic he lifted off the grinning mask and drew it over his own head the fisherman's mantle he flung over the body of the priest which he concealed behind the hangings and drew the priestly mantle about his own brawny shoulders fate had given him a disguise alkhemi might well be searching now for the blasphemer who dared defend himself against a sacred snake but who would dream of looking for him under the mask of a priest he strode boldly from the alcove and headed for one of the arched doorways at random but he had not taken a dozen strides when he wheeled again all his senses edged for peril a band of masked figures filed down the stair appareled exactly as he was he hesitated caught in the open and stood still trusting to his disguise 
though cold sweat gathered on his forehead and the backs of his hands. No word was spoken. Like phantoms, they descended into the great hall and moved past him toward a black arch. The leader carried an ebon staff, which supported a grinning white skull, and Conan knew it was one of the ritualistic processions so inexplicable to a foreigner, but which played a strong, and often sinister, part in the Stygian religion. The last figure turned his head slightly toward the motionless Cimmerian, as if expecting him to follow. Not to do what was obviously expected of him would rouse instant suspicion. Conan fell in behind the last man, and suited his gait to their measured pace. They traversed a long, dark, vaulted corridor in which, Conan noticed uneasily, the skull of the staff glowed phosphorescently. He felt a surge of unreasoning wild animal panic that urged him to rip out his knife and slash right and left at these uncanny figures to flee madly from the grim, dark temple. But he held himself in check, fighting down the dim, monstrous intuitions that rose in the back of his mind and peopled the gloom with shadowy shapes of horror, and presently he barely stifled a sigh of relief as they filed through a great double-valved door which was three times higher than a man and emerged into the starlight. Conan wondered if he dared fade into some dark alley, but hesitated, uncertain, and down the long dark street they padded silently while such folks as they met turned their heads away and fled from them. The procession kept far out from the walls. To turn and bolt into any of the alleys they passed would be too conspicuous. While he mentally fumed and cursed, they came to a low-arched gateway in the southern wall, and through this they filed. Ahead of them and about them lay clusters of low, flat-topped mud houses and palm groves, shadowy in the starlight. Now, if ever, thought Conan, was the time to escape his silent companions. But the moment the gate was left behind them, those companions were no longer silent. They began to mutter excitedly among themselves. The measured, ritualistic gate was abandoned. The staff with its skull was tucked unceremoniously under the leader's arm, and the whole group broke ranks and hurried onward. And Conan hurried with them. For in the low murmur of speech he had caught a word that galvanized him. The word was, Through utter themes. End of chapter 17Chapter 18 of The Hour of the Dragon by Robert E. Howard. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 I Am the Woman Who Never Died. Conan stared with burning interest at his masked companions. One of them was the Utterthemes, or else the destination of the band was a rendezvous with the man he sought and he knew what that destination was, when beyond the palms he glimpsed a black triangular bulk looming against the shadowy sky. They passed through the belt of huts and groves, and if any man saw them he was careful not to show himself. The huts were dark. Behind them the black towers of Kahemi rose gloomily against the stars that were mirrored in the waters of the harbor. Ahead of them the desert stretched away in dim darkness. Somewhere a jackal yapped. The quick passing sandals of the silent neophytes made no noise in the sand. They might have been ghosts moving toward that colossal pyramid that rose out of the murk of the desert. There was no sound over all the sleeping land. Conan's heart beat quicker as he gazed at the grim black wedge that stood etched against the stars, and his impatience to close with the utter themes in whatever conflict the meeting might mean was not unmixed with a fear of the unknown. No man could approach one of those somber piles of black stone without apprehension. 
the very name was a symbol of repellent horror among the northern nations and legends hinted that the stygians did not build them that they were in the land at whatever immeasurably ancient date the dark-skinned people came into the land of the great river as they approached the pyramid he glimpsed a dim glow near the base which presently resolved itself into a doorway on either side of which brooded stone lions with the heads of women cryptic inscrutable nightmares crystallized in stone the leader of the band made straight for the doorway in the deep well of which conan saw a shadowy figure the leader paused an instant beside this dim figure and then vanished into the dark interior and one by one the others followed as each masked priest passed through the gloomy portal he was halted briefly by the mysterious guardian and something passed between them some word or gesture conan could not make out seeing this the cimmerian purposely lagged behind and stooping pretended to be fumbling with the fastening of his sandal not until the last of the masked figures had disappeared did he straighten and approach the portal he was uneasily wondering if the guardian of the temple were human remembering some tales he had heard but his doubts were set at rest a dim bronze crescent glowing just within the door lighted a long narrow corridor that ran away into the blackness and a man standing silent in the mouth of it wrapped in a wide black cloak no one else was in sight obviously the masked priest had disappeared down the corridor over the cloak that was drawn about his lower features the stygian's piercing eyes regarded conan sharply with his left hand he made a curious gesture on a venture conan imitated it but evidently another gesture was expected the stygian's right hand came from under his cloak with a gleam of steel and his murderous stab would have pierced the heart of an ordinary man but he was dealing with one whose thews were nerved to the quickness of a jungle cat even as the dagger flashed in the dim light conan caught the dusky wrist and smashed his clenched right fist against the stygian's jaw the man's head went back against the stone wall with a dull crunch that told of a fractured skull standing for an instant above him conan listened intently the cresset burned low casting vague shadows about the door nothing stirred in the blackness beyond though far away and below him as it seemed he caught the faint muffled note of a gong he stooped and dragged the body behind the great bronze door which stood wide opening inward and then the cimmerian went warily but swiftly down the corridor toward what doom he did not even try to guess he had not gone far when he halted baffled the corridor split in two branches and he had no way of knowing which the masked priest had taken at a venture he chose the left the floor slanted slightly downward and was worn smooth by many feet here and there a dim cresset cast a faint nightmarish twilight conan wondered uneasily for what purpose these colossal piles had been reared in what forgotten age this was an ancient ancient land no man knew how many ages the black temples of stygia had looked against the stars narrow black arches opened occasionally to right and left but he kept to the main corridor although a conviction that he had taken the wrong branch was growing in him even with their start on him he should have overtaken the priest by this time he was growing nervous the silence was like a tangible thing and yet he had a feeling that he was not alone more than once passing a nighted arch he seemed to feel the glare of unseen eyes fixed upon him he paused half minded to turn back to where the corridor had first branched he wheeled abruptly knife lifted every nerve tingling a girl stood at the mouth of a smaller tunnel staring fixedly at him her ivory skin showed her to be a stygian of some ancient noble family 
and like all such women she was tall lithe voluptuously figured her hair a great pile of black foam among which gleamed a sparkling ruby but for her velvet sandals and broad jewel crusted girdle about her supple waist she was quite nude what do you hear she demanded to answer would betray his alien origin he remained motionless a grim somber figure in the hideous mask with the plumes floating over him his alert gaze sought the shadows behind her and found them empty but there might be hordes of fighting men within her call she advanced toward him apparently without apprehension though with suspicion you are not a priest she said you are a fighting man even with that mask that is plain there is as much difference between you and a priest as there is between a man and a woman by set she exclaimed halting suddenly her eyes flaring wide i do not believe you are even a stygian with a movement too quick for the eye to follow his hand closed about her round throat lightly as a caress not a sound out of you he muttered her smooth ivory flesh was cold as marble yet there was no fear in the wide dark marvelous eyes which regarded him do not fear she answered calmly i will not betray you but are you not mad to come a stranger and a foreigner to the forbidden temple of set i am looking for the priest the utter themes he answered is he in this temple why do you seek him she parried he has something of mine which was stolen i will lead you to him she volunteered so promptly that his suspicions were instantly roused don't play with me girl he growled i do not play with you i have no love for the utter themes he hesitated then made up his mind after all he was as much in her power as she was in his walk beside me he commanded shifting his grasp from her throat to her wrist but walk with care if you make a suspicious move she led him down the slanting corridor down and down until there were no more cressets and he groped his way in darkness aware less by sight than by feel and sense of the woman at his side once when he spoke to her she turned her head toward him and he was startled to see her eyes glowing like golden fire in the dark dim doubts and vague monstrous suspicions haunted his mind but he followed her through a labyrinthine maze of black corridors that confused even his primitive sense of direction he mentally cursed himself for a fool allowing himself to be led into that black abode of mystery but it was too late to turn back now again he felt life and movement in the darkness about him sensed peril and hunger burning impatiently in the blackness unless his ears deceived him he caught a faint sliding noise that ceased and receded at a muttered command from the girl she led him at last into a chamber lighted by a curious seven-branched candelabrum in which black candles burned weirdly he knew they were far below the earth the chamber was square with walls and ceilings of polished black marble and furnished after the manner of the ancient stygians there was a couch of ebony covered with black velvet and on a black stone dais lay a carven mummy case Conan waited expectantly, staring at the various black arches which opened into the chamber, but the girl made no move to go farther. Stretching herself on the couch with feline suppleness, she intertwined her fingers behind her sleek head and regarded him from under long, drooping lashes. Well, he demanded impatiently, what are you doing? Where's the utter themes? There is no haste she answered lazily what is an hour or a day or a year or a century for that matter take off your mask let me see your features 
with a grunt of annoyance conan dragged off the bulky headpiece and the girl nodded as if in approval as she scanned his dark scarred face and blazing eyes there is strength in you great strength you could strangle a bullock he moved restlessly his suspicion growing with his hand on his hilt he peered into the gloomy arches if you brought me into a trap he said you won't live to enjoy your handiwork are you going to get off that couch and do as you promised or do i have to his voice trailed away he was staring at the mummy case on which the countenance of the occupant was carved in ivory with the startling vividness of a forgotten art there was a disquieting familiarity about that carven mask and with something of a shock he realized what it was there was a startling resemblance between it and the face of the girl lolling on the ebon couch she might have been the model from which it was carved but he knew the portrait was at least centuries old archaic hieroglyphics were scrawled across the lacquered lid and seeking back into his mind for tag ends of learning picked up here and there as incidentals of an adventurous life he spelled them out and said aloud akivasha you have heard of princess akivasha inquired the girl on the couch who hasn't he grunted the name of that ancient evil beautiful princess still lived in the world over in song and legend though ten thousand years had rolled their cycles since the daughter of tutamon had reveled in purple feasts amid the black halls of ancient luxor her only sin was that she loved life and all the meanings of life said the stygian girl to win life she courted death she could not bear to think of growing old and shriveled and worn and dying at last as hags die she wooed darkness like a lover and his gift was life life that not being life as mortals know it can never grow old and fade she went into the shadows to cheat age and death conan glared at her with eyes that were suddenly burning slits and he wheeled and tore the lid from the sarcophagus it was empty behind him the girl was laughing and the sound froze the blood in his veins he whirled back to her the short hairs on his neck bristling you are akivasha he grated she laughed and shook back her burnished locks spread her arms sensuously i am akivasha i am the woman who never died who never grew old who fools say was lifted from the earth by the gods in the full bloom of her youth and beauty to queen it forever in some celestial clime <laughs> nay it is in the shadows that mortals find immortality ten thousand years ago i died to live forever give me your lips strong man rising lithely she came to him rose on tiptoe and flung her arms about his massive neck scowling down into her upturned beautiful countenance he was aware of a fearful fascination and an icy fear love me she whispered her head thrown back eyes closed and lips parted give me of your blood to renew my youth and perpetuate my everlasting life i will make you too immortal i will teach you the wisdom of all the ages all the secrets that have lasted out the eons in the blackness beneath these dark temples i will make you king of that shadowy horde which revels among the tombs of the ancients when night veils the desert and bats flit across the moon i am weary of priests and magicians and captive girls drag screaming through the portals of death i desire a man love me barbarian she pressed her dark head down against his mighty breast and he felt a sharp pang at the base of his throat 
With a curse, he tore her away and flung her sprawling across the couch. Damned vampire! Blood was trickling from a tiny wound in his throat. She reared up on the couch like a serpent poised to strike, all the golden fires of hell blazing in her wide eyes. Her lips drew back, revealing white, pointed teeth. Fool! she shrieked. Do you think? to escape me you will live and die in darkness i have brought you far below the temple you can never find your way out alone you can never cut your way through those which guard the tunnels but for my protection the sons of set would long ago have taken you into their bellies fool i shall yet drink your blood keep away from me or i'll slash you asunder he grunted, his flesh crawling with revulsion. You may be immortal, but steel will dismember you. As he backed toward the arch through which he had entered, the light went out suddenly. All the candles were extinguished at once, though he did not know how, for Akivasha had not touched them. But the vampire's laugh rose mockingly behind him, poison sweet as the vials of hell and he sweated as he groped in the darkness for the arch in a near panic his fingers encountered an opening and he plunged through it whether it was the arch through which he had entered he did not know nor did he very much care his one thought was to get out of the haunted chamber which had housed that beautiful hideous undead fiend for so many centuries his wanderings through those black winding tunnels were a sweating nightmare. Behind him and about him he heard faint slitherings and glidings, and once the echo of that sweet hellish laughter he had heard in the chambers of Akivasha. He slashed furiously at sounds and movements he heard or imagined he heard in the darkness near him, and once his sword cut through some yielding tenuous substance that might have been cobwebs. He had a desperate feeling that he was being played with, lured deeper and deeper into ultimate night, before being set upon by demoniac talon and fang. And through his fear ran the sickening revulsion of his discovery. The legend of Akivasha was so old, and among the evil tales told of her ran a thread of beauty and idealism of everlasting youth. To so many dreamers and poets and lovers, she was not alone the evil princess of Stygian legend, but the symbol of eternal youth and beauty, shining forever in some far realm of the gods. And this was the hideous reality. This foul perversion was the truth of that everlasting life. Through his physical revulsion, ran the sense of a shattered dream of man's idolatry its glittering gold proved slime and cosmic filth a wave of futility swept over him a dim fear of the falseness of all men's dreams and idolatries and now he knew that his ears were not playing him tricks he was being followed and his pursuers were closing in on him in the darkness sounded shufflings and slidings that were never made by human feet, no, nor by the feet of any normal animal. The underworld had its bestial life, too, perhaps. They were behind him. He turned to face them, though he could see nothing, and slowly backed away. Then the sound ceased, even before he turned his head and saw, somewhere down the long corridor, a glow of light. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of The Hour of the Dragon by Robert E. Howard This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 19 In the Hall of the Dead Conan moved cautiously in the direction of the light he had seen, his ear cocked over his shoulder, but there was no further sound of pursuit, 
though he felt the darkness pregnant with sentient life. The glow was not stationary. It moved, bobbing grotesquely along. Then he saw the source. The tunnel he was traversing crossed another, wider corridor some distance ahead of him, and along this latter tunnel filed a bizarre procession. Four tall gaunt men in black hooded robes leaning on staffs. The leader held a torch above his head, a torch that burned with a curious steady glow. Like phantoms, they passed across his limited range of vision and vanished, with only a fading glow to tell of their passing. Their appearance was indescribably eldritch. They were not Stygians, not like anything Conan had ever seen. He doubted if they were even humans. They were like black ghosts, stalking ghoulishly along the haunted tunnels. But his position could be no more desperate than it was. Before the inhuman feet behind him could resume their slithering advance at the fading of the distant illumination, Conan was running down the corridor. He plunged into the other tunnel and saw, far down it, small in the distance, the weird procession moving in the glowing sphere. He stole noiselessly after them, then shrank suddenly back against the wall as he saw them halt and cluster together as if conferring on some matter. They turned as if to retrace their steps, and he slipped into the nearest archway. Groping in the darkness to which he had become so accustomed that he could all but see through it, he discovered that the tunnel did not run straight, but meandered and he fell back before the first turn, so that the light of the strangers should not fall on him as they passed. But as he stood there, he was aware of a low hum of sound from somewhere behind him, like the murmur of human voices. Moving down the corridor in that direction, he confirmed his first suspicion. Abandoning his original intention of following the ghoulish travelers to whatever destination might be theirs, he set out in the direction of the voices. Presently he saw a glint of light ahead of him, and, turning into the corridor from which it issued, saw a broad arch filled with a dim glow at the other end. On his left a narrow stone stair went upward, and instinctive caution prompted him to turn and mount the stair the voices he heard were coming from beyond that flame-filled arch the sounds fell away beneath him as he climbed and presently he came out through a low arched door into a vast open space glowing with a weird radiance he was standing on a shadowy gallery from which he looked down into a broad, dim-lit hall of colossal proportions. It was a hall of the dead, which few ever see but the silent priests of Stygia. Along the black walls rose tier above tier of carven, painted sarcophagi. Each stood in a niche in the dusky stone and the tears mounted up and up to be lost in the gloom above. Thousands of carven masks stared impassively down upon the group in the midst of the hall, rendered futile and insignificant by that vast array of the dead. Of this group ten were priests, and though they had discarded their masks, Conan knew they were the priests he had accompanied to the pyramid. They stood before a tall, hawk-faced man, beside a black altar, on which lay a mummy in rotting swathings. And the altar seemed to stand in the heart of a living fire, which pulsed and shimmered, dripping flakes of quivering golden flame on the black stones about it. This dazzling glow emanated from a great red jewel which lay upon the altar, and in the reflection of which the faces of the priests looked ashy and corpse-like. As he looked, Conan felt the presence of all the weary leagues and the weary nights and days of his long quest, and he trembled with a mad urge to rush among these silent priests 
clear his way with mighty blows of naked steel and grasp the red gem with passion taut fingers but he gripped himself with iron control and crouched down in the shadow of the stone balustrade a glance showed him that a stair led down into the hall from the gallery hugging the wall and half hidden in the shadows he glared into the dimness of the vast place seeking other priests or votaries but saw only the group about the altar in that great emptiness the voice of the man beside the altar sounded hollow and ghostly and so the word came southward the night wind whispered it the ravens croaked of it as they flew and the grim bats told it to the owls and the serpents that lurk in hoary ruins werewolf and vampire knew and the ebon-bodied demons that prowl by night the sleeping night of the world stirred and shook its heavy mane and there began a throbbing of drums in deep darkness and the echoes of far weird cries frightened men who walked by dusk for the heart of Ahriman had come again into the world to fulfill its cryptic destiny ask me not how i the utter themes of kehemi and the night heard the word before thoth ammon who calls himself prince of all wizards there are secrets not meet for such ears even as yours and thoth ammon is not the only lord of the black ring i knew and i went to meet the heart which came southward it was like a magnet which drew me unerringly from death to death it came riding on a river of human blood blood feeds it blood draws it its power is greatest when there is blood on the hands that grasp it when it is wrested by slaughter from its holder wherever it gleams blood is spilt and kingdoms totter and the forces of nature are put in turmoil and here i stand the master of the heart and have summoned you to come secretly who are faithful to me to share in the black kingdom that shall be tonight you shall witness the breaking of thoth ammon's chains which enslave us and the birth of empire who am i even i thoth Uthethemes, to know what powers lurk and dream in those crimson deeps it holds secrets forgotten for three thousand years but i shall learn these shall tell me he waved his hand toward the silent shapes that lined the hall see how they sleep staring through their carven masks kings queens generals priests wizards the dynasties and the nobility of stygia for ten thousand years the touch of the heart will awaken them from their long slumber long long the heart throbbed and pulsed in ancient stygia here was its home in the centuries before it journeyed to acheron the ancients knew its full power and they will tell me when by its magic i restore them to life to labor for me i will rouse them will waken them will learn their forgotten wisdom the knowledge locked in those withered skulls by the lord of the dead we shall enslave the living i kings and generals and wizards of old shall be our helpers and our slaves who shall stand before us look this dried shriveled thing on the altar was once thoth mekri a high priest of set who died three thousand years ago 
he was an adept of the black ring who will tell us of its powers lifting the great jewel the speaker laid it on the withered breast of the mummy and lifted his hand as he began an incantation but the incantation was never finished with his hand lifted and his lips parted he froze glaring past his acolytes and they wheeled to stare in the direction in which he was looking through the black arch of a door four gaunt black robed shapes had filed into the great hall their faces were dim yellow ovals in the shadows of their hoods who are you ejaculated the other themes in a voice as pregnant with danger as the hiss of a cobra are you mad to invade the holy shrine of set the tallest of the strangers spoke and his voice was toneless as a kithian temple bell we follow conan of aquilonia he is not here answered the utter themes shaking back his mantle from his right hand with a curious menacing gesture like a panther unleashing his talons you lie he is in this temple we tracked him from a corpse behind the bronze door of the outer portal through a maze of corridors we were following his devious trail when we became aware of this conclave we go now to take it up again but first give us the heart of ariman death is the portion of madmen murmured the utter themes moving nearer the speaker his priests closed in on cat-like feet but the strangers did not appear to heed who can look upon it without desire said the kithian in kithia we have heard of it it will give us power over the people which cast us out glory and wonder dream in its crimson deeps give it to us before we slay you a fierce cry rang out as a priest leaped with a flicker of steel but before he could strike a scaly staff licked out and touched his breast and he fell as a dead man falls in an instant the mummies were staring down on a scene of blood and horror curved knives flashed and crimsoned snaky staffs licked in and out and wherever they touched a man that man screamed and died at the first stroke conan had bounded up and was racing down the stairs he caught only glimpses of that brief fiendish fight saw men swaying locked in battle and streaming blood saw one kithian fairly hacked to pieces yet still on his feet dealing death when the utter themes smote him on the breast with his open hand and he dropped dead though naked steel had not been enough to destroy his uncanny vitality by the time conan's hurtling feet left the stair the fight was all but over three of the kithians were down slashed and cut to ribbons and disemboweled but of the stygians only the utter themes remained on his feet he rushed at the remaining kithian his empty hand lifted like a weapon and that hand was black as that of a negro but before he could strike the staff in the tall kithian's hand licked out seeming to elongate itself as the yellow man thrust the point touched the bosom of thothothemes and he staggered again and yet again the staff licked out and thothothemes reeled and fell dead his features blotted out in a rush of blackness that made the whole of him the same hue as his enchanted hand the kithian turned toward the jewel that burned on the breast of the mummy but conan was before him in the tense stillness the two faced each other amid that shambles with the carven mummies staring down upon them far have i followed you o king of aquilonia said the kithan calmly down the long river and over the mountains across pointain and zingara and through the hills of argos and down the coast not easily did we pick up your trail from tarantia for the priests of asura are crafty we lost it in zingara 
but we found your helmet in the forest below the border hills where you had fought with the ghouls of the forest almost we lost the trail again tonight among these labyrinths conan reflected that he had been fortunate in returning from the vampire's chamber by another route than that by which he had been led to it otherwise he would have run full into these yellow fiends instead of sighting them from afar as they smelled out his spore like human bloodhounds with whatever uncanny gift was theirs the kitten shook his head slightly as if reading his mind that is meaningless the long trail ends here why have you hounded me demanded conan poised to move in any direction with the celerity of a hair trigger it was a debt to pay answered the kithian to you who are about to die i will not withhold knowledge we were vassals of the king of aquilonia valerius long we served him but of that service we are free now my brothers by death and i by fulfilment of obligation i shall return to aquilonia with two hearts for myself the heart of ariman for valerius the heart of conan a kiss of the staff that was cut from the living tree of death the staff licked out like the dart of a viper but the slash of conan's knife was quicker the staff fell in writhing halves there was another flicker of the keen steel like a jet of lightning and the head of the kitten rolled to the floor conan wheeled and extended his hand toward the jewel then he shrank back his hair bristling his blood congealing icily for no longer a withered brown thing lay on the altar the jewel shimmered on the full arcing breast of a naked living man who lay among the mouldering bandages living conan could not decide the eyes were like dark murky glass under which shone inhuman somber fires slowly the man rose taking the jewel in his hand he towered beside the altar dusky naked with a face like a carven image mutely he extended his hand toward conan with the jewel throbbing like a living heart within it conan took it with an eerie sensation of receiving gifts from the hand of the dead he somehow realized that the proper incantations had not been made the conjurement had not been completed life had not been fully restored to his corpse who are you demanded the cimmerian the answer came in a toneless monotone like the dripping of water from stalactites in subterranean caverns i was thoth mekri i am dead well lead me out of this accursed temple will you conan requested his flesh crawling with measured mechanical steps the dead man moved toward a black arch conan followed him a glance back showed him once again the vast shadowy hall with its tiers of sarcophagi the dead men sprawled about the altar the head of the kithen he had slain stared sightlessly up at the sweeping shadows the glow of the jewel illuminated the black tunnels like an ensorcelled lamp dripping golden fire once conan caught a glimpse of ivory flesh in the shadows believed he saw the vampire that was akivasha shrinking back from the glow of the jewel and with her other less human shapes scuttled or shambled into the darkness the dead man strode straight on looking neither to right nor left his pace as changeless as the tramp of doom cold sweat gathered thick on conan's flesh icy doubts assailed him how could he know that this terrible figure out of the past was leading him to freedom but he knew that left to himself he could never untangle this bewitched maze of corridors and tunnels he followed his awful guide through blackness that loomed before and behind them 
and was filled with skulking shapes of horror and lunacy that cringed from the blinding glow of the heart then the bronze doorway was before him and conan felt the night wind blowing across the desert and saw the stars and the starlit desert across which streamed the great black shadow of the pyramid thothmekri pointed silently into the desert and then turned and stalked soundlessly back to the darkness conan stared after that silent figure that receded into the blackness on soundless inexorable feet as one that moves to a known and inevitable doom or returns to an everlasting sleep with a curse the cimmerian leaped from the doorway and fled into the desert as if pursued by demons he did not look back toward the pyramid or toward the black towers of kahemi looming dimly across the sands he headed southward toward the coast and he ran as a man runs in ungovernable panic the violent exertion shook his brain free of black cobwebs the clean desert wind blew the nightmares from his soul and his revulsion changed to a wild tide of exultation before the desert gave way to a tangle of swampy growth through which he saw the black water lying before him and the venturer at anchor he plunged through the undergrowth hip deep in the marshes dived headlong into the deep water heedless of sharks or crocodiles and swam to the galley and was clambering up the chain on to the deck dripping and exultant before the watch saw him awake you dogs roared conan knocking aside the spear the startled lookout thrust at his breast heave up the anchor lay to the doors give that fisherman a helmet full of gold and put him ashore dawn will soon be breaking and before sunrise we must be racing for the nearest port of zingara he whirled about his head the great jewel which threw off splashes of light that spotted the deck with golden fire end of chapter 19